Okay, it looks like all of the participants have been able to join and we'll go ahead and start this session today. Um, my name is Kirk Schultz, uh, the moderator for the session, uh, part of the ECHO program uh, sponsored by the uh, GVHD Interactive uh, Provider Network. Um, the presenters today will be uh, Jeff Cuvier and Iskra Pusik. Let this go forward. Um, just want to welcome you to the ECHO program. Um, and the goals of this uh, program have been to uh, provide interaction between GVHD specialists and community providers uh, to share expertise with some of the people uh, with experts in the field. Um, it's based on the ECHO model, uh, which is, uh, stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Um, and uh, these sessions are designed around case-based uh, learning and mentorship. Uh, target audience for the ECHO program uh, is uh, CE uh, um, activity intended for physicians of all specialties, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, and other healthcare professionals who treat chronic graft versus host disease. And our educational objectives in this uh, session today, as well as the ones in the past and in the future, after completing this, you will be able to explain about chronic GVHD atypical manifestations in organ systems, uh, discuss what is known about chronic GVHD um, in the various organ systems involved and integrate this into your management for atypical chronic GVHD um, and including the limitations. I've just given you the welcome and this is our agenda for today. Uh, this will be followed after I finish uh, by uh, Dr. Jeff Cuvier, who will uh, take us through about a 20 to 25 minute presentation on a didactic presentation around atypical GVHD and discuss the NIH paper uh, that was recently published on this topic. And uh, Dr. Iskapusik will present a couple cases for discussion, and then we will save 10 minutes at the end for an open discussion for any kind of questions that you might have. If you do have a, a question, uh, you can type it into the chat or uh, when we open it up for open discussion, you can raise your hand and you'll actually be able to um, uh, ask a question toward the end. Uh, faculty disclosures are as follows, and uh, I just give you a brief minute to uh, take a look at these. And also for um, the uh, rest of the uh, disclosures. So the ECHO program um, has been set up. This is again, wanna take our hat off to the Aplastic Anemia MDS uh, International Foundation who has uh, sponsored this. Um, and uh, this is partnered with uh, Meredith Cowden Foundation and Be The Match. And, and it's, uh, I, I have really enjoyed the first four sessions and I hope you enjoy this one today. This will be recorded and you will be able to look at it later. And um, as I've said already there for questions, uh, please type any questions you have in the chat. And we will have toward the end uh, time for uh, verbal questions and ask you to raise your hand at that time. Some helpful print uh, uh, points uh, is to keep your camera on during the program, mute your microphone, please. And, uh, and as I've already said about raising your hand and just state your name and your institution when you do ask a verbal question toward the end. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna just stop my sharing and Jeff is gonna come on. And Jeff Cuvier is a, uh, at the uh, University of Manitoba at the uh, Cancer Care Manitoba and um, a pediatric hematologist oncologist who is specialized in chronic GVHD. Take it away, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schultz, and welcome uh, to everybody here this morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give a presentation this morning on the, the typical features of chronic graft versus host disease. And I'm going to emphasize uh, a lot initially about the challenges with actually coming to atypical chronic GVHD diagnosis. Uh, my disclosures are a uh, consultancy honorarium from Mulcanny Biotech. There's uh, no uh, disclosures related specifically to this talk. As Dr. Schultz already uh, mentioned, uh, we're going to have uh, three basic objectives. We're going to be uh, explaining how chronic graft versus host disease can present with some atypical manifestations in organ systems that are not classically described by the NIH consensus criteria. We're going to discuss a little bit about what is known and what is not known about chronic graft versus host disease that involves the hematopoietic system, the peripheral and central nervous system, musculoskeletal system, and the kidneys. And we're going to review how to integrate the assessment of atypical chronic GVHD into patient care, including some of the limitations of doing so. So just as way of background, and as I'm sure that everybody who's on this call uh, is already aware. Jeff, if your, your slides aren't advancing, you need to go into presentation mode, please. Okay, 
Uh, I am in presentation mode. It's showing your slides on the side. Okay, just a second. So right here. Sorry, everybody. Mine does say that it is in presenter mode. Okay. Well, you, go ahead and at least uh, just get down to your. I think you're on slide three or four, um, but uh, it's still showing your first slide. Okay. Is it moving now? Uh, yeah. And again, it's not in presentation mode, so we can see the slides on the left. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right. Sorry, everybody. I'm what going to. Yeah, I'm going to have to leave a like, but I'm not it's sure how to. Something like what is it? Just click slideshow. Maybe it will do it. Go up to the slideshow on the bar. I think it's okay, Jeff. You can okay, go ahead. We're going to we're going to get well. going like, like this so that we don't end up. Okay, so I'm sorry about that, everybody. Um, so the National Institutes of Health Consensus Projects uh, were started 17 years ago, and um, there have been three iterations of these to date in 2005, 2014, and 2020. And these represent the most up-to-date knowledge and the expert perspectives on chronic graft versus host disease and cover all aspects, uh, including diagnosis, pathology, supportive care, biology, response, and clinical trials. In particular, in the 2005 and 2014 diagnostic and staging working groups, uh, there was what we now refer to as the NIH consensus criteria that describe the ways with which we should be diagnosing chronic graft versus host disease using contemporary uh, mechanisms uh, to do so. These also describe the severity scoring by organ system, as well as more global severity scoring of chronic graft versus host disease. And these diagnostic and staging uh, criteria were used really to help clinicians aid in their clinical evaluation of patients, while also providing standardized and minimal diagnostic criteria for entrance into clinical trials. The 2005 and 2014 NIH consensus criteria introduced some important concepts around graft versus host disease, and particularly for chronic graft versus host disease, separated it as a distinct syndrome from acute chronic graft versus host disease, and really importantly, established that chronic graft versus host disease could occur at any time after transplant. It was no longer seen only after day 100 and rather was a time-independent phenomenon. There were eight classic organ systems, including the skin, the mouth, the eyes, the oropharynx, the lungs, the musculoskeletal system, the liver, the gastrointestinal system, uh, that were considered to be the classic organ systems. Um, but what we're going to talk about more are the other organ systems and how they may very well be affected by atypical chronic GVHD and had a variety of clinical manifestations and severity. What was really important about this was that the manifestations of chronic GVHD could be divided in those that were diagnostic. And the picture that you see there, which is poikiloderma and sclerosis, that's a very diagnostic feature. If you see that, you don't need to have a biopsy. Distinctive manifestations were those that were quite often seen in chronic GVHD, but may very well need to have an additional test to help to establish the diagnosis. Common features were those that could be seen in both acute and chronic graft versus host disease and were felt to be not specific enough uh, to establish the diagnosis. And then for, finally, there was this other category called the other manifestations. And that's what we're going to focus on here today. And these were manifestations that were felt to be rare or where it was uncertain if they were in fact related to chronic graft versus host disease. In the 2020 uh, NIH consensus form, when we were doing the highly morbid forms report that really looked at chronic GVHD affecting the skin and the lungs and the ocular system, it was recognized that chronic graft versus host disease often manifested in atypical ways in classic organ systems, and it may also impact the non-classical organ systems. 
And, but there was really very little that had actually been written about this. And so about a year and a half ago, we took upon the, the project of trying to look at all of the available uh, evidence around the atypical chronic GVHD features that might contribute significantly to patient morbidity and mortality. And the article that I'm going to mostly be referencing is this one that was published in Transplant and Cellular Therapy uh, earlier this uh, fall, that it really summarizes the most up-to-date knowledge on the atypical features of chronic GVHD. And the objectives was to define what is known and what is not known about these atypical features, to provide clinicians and researchers with provisional diagnostic criteria for the atypical features, and then to develop a research agenda for the next three to seven years to help to understand these atypical features better. This is the major figure that was uh, presented in, and what you can see on your right are the features that we already defined, called the def NIH defined chronic GVHD target organs and manifestations with those involved representing diagnostic features. By comparison on your left are the atypical chronic graft versus host disease organs and manifestations that may have uh, features in relation to chronic graft versus host disease. And you can see the various organ systems, including the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, additional features in the lungs, the serosal membranes, the kidneys, the musculoskeletal system, and well as immune mediated cytokines. Some very uh, important uh, things just to mention about the atypical chronic GVHD features is that we don't necessarily know a lot about all of these. And the relation to chronic GVHD from a pathophysiologic perspective may be uncertain. The level of evidence as features in many of these may not be high. And so this in some ways becomes uh, a, a bit of a discussion about whether these really truly do reflect chronic GVHD. Secondly, if you look at disorders like ITP and myasthenia gravis, are these actually in fact closer to their initial autoimmune counterpart and have nothing really to do with chronic GVHD or in fact, are they part of a larger chronic GVHD syndrome? And why this is important is because this may actually influence how we may start to conceptualize treating these particular atypical features. If they're more like their autoimmune counterpart, we might use treatments that are already well-established, but if they're part of chronic GVHD, we may need to start thinking about it from that sort of a perspective. For the clinicians, this is really important, is that there are many confounding factors that hinder the assessment of causality. We know that many medications and many infections that transplant patients have uh, have very similar clinical features to many of the atypical features, and they may be uh, present at the exact same time. And this makes the clinical assessment very difficult. And this is particularly challenging for clinicians when an atypical manifestation occurs in isolation without any other diagnostic chronic GVHD features. This is from a paper uh, uh, published by Ken Cook uh, and colleagues a few years ago that really is a nice outline of the pathophysiology of uh, chronic graft versus host disease. And what I really would like to try to emphasize is that when you look at what we do know about the pathophysiology of atypical chronic GVHD, there is a significant um, component of it that relates to the area around chronic inflammation and dysregulated immunity and lack of central and peripheral tolerance. Furthermore, we know that a lot of these features have got to do with endothelial damage. And in the paper, we talk about what we know about the endothelium being a target of chronic graft versus host disease and its relation to things such as cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarctions, increased incidence of deep venous thrombosis in patients who have uh, chronic graft versus host disease. In the paper, we provide a number of provisional diagnostic criteria for the atypical chronic GVHD manifestations, and the particular diseases are all listed there. I would refer people to the paper for more detail because we're not going to have time uh, to cover all, but I am going to try to focus on a few of these that we sort of think are highlight um, disorders. So first of all, I'd like to chat about immune-mediated cytopenias and their relation to chronic graft versus host disease. We know that disorders like ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, autoimmune neutropenia, and Evans syndrome occur in about 2 to 8% of patients after allogeneic transplant. Of course, we're all well aware that there are many reasons for cytopenias after transplant, and it makes us wonder whether the immune-mediated cytopenias are perhaps underrecognized. If you look at the studies that, that look at immune-mediated cytopenias after allotransplant, chronic graft versus host disease remains a risk factor, a multivariable analysis in some, but not all 
chronic GVHD studies. We know that children have a higher rate of immune-mediated cytopenias, particularly when they're transplanted for non-malignant disorders and with cord blood. But one of the fundamental problems is that we don't at this point have a true understanding whether immune-mediated cytopenias represent the donor transplanted immune system reacting against itself in an autologous way, meaning donor immune system against donor, or in fact, is this donor versus recipient cells, uh, for instance, uh, host uh, uh, red cells or platelets that may not uh, have necessarily been uh, gone with the conditioning regimen. In this very, very nice paper uh, published by uh, Natasha Buxbaum and uh, Steve Pavletic, published about two years ago, they really uh, illustrated what is known about autoimmune disease uh, in the post-transplant uh, uh, setting. And one of the factors is, is that central immune tolerance is often uh, lost uh, and there can be a variety of reasons for this, including things like acute graft versus host disease that may impact the thymus, um, simply age, and older individuals may not have a robust thymopoiesis. And what that means is that we're dependent more upon peripheral immune tolerance and regulatory T cells after transplant to help regulate. And what they have uh, nicely shown is, is that when peripheral immune tolerance is also compromised, you're at much uh, higher risk to get auto-reactive uh, auto B cells that produce. And in the particular situation for autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we know that these individuals, we know that individuals can have pan-reactive uh, autoantibodies against red cells that result both in an intravascular hemolysis through complement as well as an extravascular hemolysis through the reticular endothelial system. What about central nervous system and chronic graft versus host disease? Well, there are a wide variety of clinical syndromes that are suspected as being due to chronic graft versus host disease of the central nervous system. It has been reported for conditions such as acute dis disseminated encephalomyelitis, a multiple sclerosis-like presentation, and a CNS vasculitis with T-cell infiltration. The problem is, is that these are not necessarily the most common things that one are seen. And what is more often seen, particularly in adults, where up to 60% can have some form of neurocognitive dysfunction, often in the form of things like problems with attention, memory, executive functioning, anxiety, and depression. And so the question is, is this in fact related to chronic GVHD or is it related to other things such as medications? And in this really nice paper that uh, Kelly McDonald uh, and her group out of Australia uh, published along with Rachel Adams as the first uh, author just recently published in Blood, using non-lethal chronic GVHD mouse models uh, we're able to de uh, detect donor cells actually infiltrating into brain parenchyma. And so in their mouse models, what was initially seen was initially a very high CD8 T cell infiltration of the brain about two weeks after transplant, but then declined over the next month or two, such that by about 70 days, there was an increase in CD4 T cell infiltration and bone marrow donor-derived macrophages uh, that took on a phenotype similar to host microglial cells, although they were transcriptionally uh, different. Importantly, this was all mediated by high interferon gamma that produced generalized neuroinflammation and resulted in the mice showing defects in spatial learning and memory. And this was really the first time that it was really demonstrated that chronic GVHD of the central nervous system is quite likely a real phenomenon. And because of the high levels of interferon gamma, it might suggest that drugs such as ruxolitinib that block downstream jack stat signaling, stat signaling could potentially reduce neuroinflammation and improve cognitive functioning in chronic GVHD. What about in the peripheral nervous system? It appears to be less commonly impacted where chronic alloreactivity is felt to represent perhaps somewhere around 0.7 to 6% of allo transplant patients even though about 40 to 50% of adult patients may have some evidence of peripheral neuropathy after transplant. In terms of the particular diseases that have been seen, uh, chronic inflammatory demyelinating choline neuropathy, myasthenia gravis with anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Interestingly, about 20% of transplant patients will have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies after transplant, but they don't necessarily all develop a myasthenia gravis-like syndrome. Guillain barre ridiculous plexus neuropathies and mononeuropathies. How is this actually practically evaluated? Well, again, in this concept that many different causes can cause peripheral neuropathy. And from a clinician's point of view, it's important to state 
but you don't want to forget to rule out things like nutritional deficiencies, perineoplastic events, infections, and neurotoxic drugs, all of which are really important in transplant patients. And in the paper, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, um, but really a good physical examination by a neurologist that really understands the peripheral nervous system and the combination of nerve conduction system and electromyography can actually help to try to separate this out. And a related topic, musculoskeletal chronic GVHD, and in particular, myositis. We know, that mu we know that muscle cramps are a prominent cause of poor quality of life in individuals who have chronic GVHD, but this unfortunately is a very nonspecific symptom and it likely has multiple causes, including not just chronic GVHD of the muscles, but also peripheral neuropathy. Proximal muscle weakness can often be seen, but again, that can be confounded often by things like steroid myopathy. We know that chronic GVHD myositis likely affects 1% to 3% of our transplant patients. It is likely underdiagnosed. And why? Because muscle biopsy remains the gold standard, but of course it isn't really necessarily performed in a lot of patients because it's quite invasive. What we try to emphasize is that clinicians can use other things like creatine kinase, aldolase, electromyography, nerve conduction studies, and MRI to help to try to form causality. In the paper, we uh, describe uh, ways with which these uh, subsequent uh, tests might be used to help differentiate chronic GVHD myo myofasciitis from chronic GVHD-induced peripheral neuropathy, as well as steroid myopathy. And uh, Dr. Pusik is going to present a case uh, where this is going to uh, show how this can actually be applied in clinical practice. Here's an example of an MRI of a patient who has chronic GVHD myositis, and you can see the MRI uh, findings of fatty infiltration and superficial and subcutaneous edema that correlates with an increase in the creatinine kinase. Muscle biopsies, as stated, are not often performed, but if they are, uh, CD4 and CD8 T cell infiltrates and endomysial fibrosis uh, can be seen. And this can actually help to go on to establish uh, that this may be myositis related to chronic graft versus host disease. Very briefly, what about chronic graft versus host disease uh, involving the kidneys? We have noted for a long time that uh, disorders such as nephrotic syndrome are well associated with chronic GVHD. And again, this speaks to the endothelial dysfunction and the endothelium uh, being a component of uh, chronic GVHD L reactivity. Um, in our atypical man, uh, manuscript, we actually make some clini clinical suggestions that clinicians want to start looking at things like blood pressure, reviewing of nephrotoxic meds, but also doing things like urinalysis and urine albumin to creatinine and urine protein to creatinine ratio at various time points, usually around one to three months after transplant uh, as a way uh, to screen for this. So how should clinicians determine if a clinical manifestation is due to an atypical chronic GVHD manifestation or not? Well, the NIH consensus paper acknowledges that this is very, very difficult. And we suggest good clinical description of the problem, the association with other chronic GVHD features, trying your best to do the extensive investigations that may ultimately need to include biopsy and trying to rule out non alloreactive causes. We have proposed that one should describe the cause of a suspected atypical manifestation of chronic graft versus host disease when other chronic GVHD features are present, either concurrently or in the past, and when alternative causes have been reasonably ruled out. The problem is, and this at least at the level of expert opinion, is that many of the purported atypical chronic GVHD manifestations seem to occur in relative isolation and often as immune suppression is weaned, which makes it very difficult because you may not have other chronic GVHD features uh, to try to help uh, to, to come to causality. In the manuscript, uh, we give clinicians uh, some uh, suggestions for initial evaluations uh, for uh, workup of the atypical manifestations, as well as some additional secondary evaluations according to what the manifestation is, as well as provide uh, our perspective on what sort of research evaluations are needed in the next three to seven years to help and try to sort this out. And of course, we need to address the gaps in knowledge about atypical chronic GVHD. And this really is a paper that gives a call to action for the next three to seven years to try to begin to develop multi-institution prospective observational studies that capture all of the purported atypical chronic GVHD manifestations that combine excellence in clinical description, description of what confounding factors are present, laboratory correlates, 
and timed and event-driven biomarker assessments of the atypical manifestations. And with that, we're going to be moving on to some cases that Dr. Busick is going to be um, uh, describing. I just want to send some acknowledgments that there were a number of individuals with expertise, um, both on subspecialty and chronic graft versus host disease, uh, with particular acknowledgement to Dr. Danny Wolf and Dr. Stephen Pavletic, who were the senior authors on the paper. And with that, I will send off to Dr. Busick. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me now um, share my screen. Uh, do you see the slides? So do you, do you see my presentation? We do not as of right now. You do not. Hold on. No, we don't. It worked before when you were doing it. <laughs> yeah, it did. So I'm not sure why. Ah, okay. There you go. Now it goes. Yep. Uh, so I am Iskra Pusic from Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis. And I will show you several cases. So the first case, uh, just to put things in perspective, was happening between 2007 and 2012 when this uh, young man who had a very high risk and refractory ALL was transplanted and he was transplanted with some degree of persistent disease. He received a graft from a match, fully matched unrelated donor, peripheral blood stem cells. He received TBI as part of his conditioning. He had standard GVHD prophylaxis for the time. And then uh, he received a prophylactic a DLI after transplant considering his high-risk disease. And then about a month after DLI, he had some acute GVHD involving his skin, stage three, that resolved with um, tacrolimus and a pulse of steroids. But then about four months later, as tacrolimus was tapered off, he developed some oral lichenoid uh, GVHD and some lichenoid and hyperpigmented skin changes and start having complaints of dry eyes. And this was sought to be consistent with him developing chronic uh, GVHD. He was given another pulse of steroids. His tacrolimus level was uh, made therapeutic. Uh, his symptoms persisted and progressed and then serolimus was added. And even though he had some initial improvement, he then was worsening again, and he thought that maybe this was related to serolimus, so serolimus was stopped, and uh, mycophenolate was added. But with time, none of this worked. He probably received another pulse of steroids somewhere in between, but his uh, symptoms continued to progress. And he had some, though quite minimal, sclerodermatous changes, but then developed overwhelming pruritus and a generalized skin pain known as allodynia. And there are very prominent uh, musculoskeletal system involvement with edema that went to progress to generalized anasarca with really profound interstitial pitting edema that was unresponsive to various diuretics. And then extensive workup was done that I listed here. He had completely normal 2D echo, completely normal PFT set at the beginning. Uh, CT Dopplers were completely normal and various uh, labs such as liver function, creatinine, and albumin were all normal. And then he started developing further muscle cramps with myalgias, evidence of myositis, arthralgias, joint swelling, and some proximal muscle weakness. And again, further evaluation showed here that his CK and aldolase were elevated. All imaginable autoantibodies were tested and were all negative in, in normal limits. His ESR and, and rheumatoid factor were normal, and there was no any evidence of a vascular necrosis or infection. He also had some evidence of serocytis with some small uh, pleural effusions. So I want to show you some photographs where you can see this young man who was naturally very slim, who now has this really overwhelming and generalized um, edema involving 
all of his body, but most prominent on his extremities. And you can see maybe some sclerodermatous changes here around the waistline, but mostly his skin was kind of soft when you would feel it with then some lichenoid areas and this, this overwhelming edema. And again, uh, here you can see how his um, lower extremities uh, look like. I uh, don't have the picture of his MRI. This is a picture of MRIs that Dr. Cuvelier showed you, but this is kind of a typical finding where you can see uh, that there is some skin thickening and some edema subcutaneously and around the fat and then overlying edema, uh, overlying the, the fascia of the muscles. Aside from that, he had several other organs involved. He had character conjunctivitis, he covered with uh, Schirmers that were measured at the time and were zero. He had uh, dry mouths with some tongue atrophy. He had initially normal PFTs, but then with time he developed combined obstructive and restrictive ventilatory defect, and then later on more predominantly restrictive uh, issues. He had peripheral neuropathy, hypogamma globulinemia, and then this young, uh, normally very jolly and upbeat uh, man, of course, was struggling with worsening fatigue, anxiety, and depression. And if we look at his uh, treatment history, at the beginning, these were the usual suspects, prednisone, tacrolimus, serolimus, mycophenolate. Then when that didn't work, we had a study open at WashU, which was the first time ever using pomalidomide for chronic GVHD. Later, similar study was done at NIH, but at this time, this was uh, the first time pomalidomide was used for that indication. And he was on it for about three months and did not tolerate it well at all. He had worsening cramps, worsening fatigue, and then he was discontinued from pomalidomide and received a couple of rounds of the clizumab that we were able to get for him and was started on ECP that maybe worked a little bit at the beginning, but then he continued to progress. It was started on, it was tried on rituximab and imatinib, and this was 2009. So this was before these drugs were compared hand-to-hand uh, -hand in, in a multicenter trial. And when that didn't work, we sent him to our colleagues at NIH where he was extensively evaluated, had additional biopsies, additional imaging, um, and ad additional kind of advices. We all uh, put our heads together uh, how to treat him. However, um, he continued to progress and was again receiving a high dose of steroids at the time, some cyclosporin, and then he was sent to Dana-Farber that had um, IL-2, I think in combination with serolimus uh, study, however, did not respond. And actually after he returned from there, he had new skin ulcerations and, and severe infection ended up in the ICU for a period of time. And when he recovered, he was tried on methotrexate and bortezomib that in the end, he progressed through. And then as a desperate measure to try uh, to get his uh, GVHD under control, he underwent second allergenic transplant from a different unrelated donor. And unfortunately, throughout that process, he passed away. So I will uh, bring back uh, this uh, table that Dr. Colvier showed you, just to kind of underline these differences in somebody who has chronic GVHD-related myofasciitis and some other alternative diagnoses that we can uh, um, contemplate, primarily steroid myopathy. And we can maybe, I can bring back Dr. Courbier. What I wanna underline here is that also muscle pain is something that is much more pronounced in, in myofasciitis and usually not present in, in steroid myopathy. And then findings on, muscle biopsy and, and on the MRI that are abnormal with chronic GVHD uh, myofasciitis. And today is 2022, and this is the quote for the paper that 
um, we were already talking about earlier. And really, uh, even though the years has passed and we now have three drugs that are available for treatment of chronic GVHD and FDA approved, uh, really no current data exists regarding specific treatment recommendations. And usually you follow the general guidelines. So I guess nowadays we would try this these new drugs and not necessarily do a second transplant, but I don't know whether we would be more successful. So I would uh, like to bring Dr. Kurgier back if he would like to give additional comments. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very uh, sad case, but I think it really does uh, illustrate uh, atypical features. And I guess my, my first comment is, is, is how would we assess this now in 2022? And um, you, you certainly have described a number of things that are very uh, uh, well known with chronic GVHD, uh, with the skin changes and the lichenoid changes. But just to illustrate to the people who are listening is that there are, you know, there are a bunch of things that you've presented that we would now suggest, or at least we'd say these are very highly likely part of chronic GVHD syndrome. And that includes the, the edema, the anasarca, uh, the potential peripheral neuropathy, the myositis uh, that was described. And, and interesting also the restrictive lung disease. Um, one of the things that we recognize in the atypical paper is uh, things like uh, idiopathic pleuropulmonary fibrosis um, that, that may very well uh, show up like, uh, like this, that isn't necessarily bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, so absolutely, this is a, a patient who uh, one might consider doing things like nerve conduction syndrome, uh, nerve conduction studies uh, and uh, in EMG to try to figure this part on out. But as you've clearly shown the muscle pain, uh, which we described as being something uh, very uh, common and, and also a significant problem for quality of life uh, in, in these patients as being a real uh, phenomenon. And you're absolutely correct. We still don't have any good data. Uh, I'm, I'm interested. I've heard uh, anecdotally of uh, some individuals uh, suggesting that things like just supplementing the magnesium helps their, mag helps their um, muscle pains. I'm not aware of any data. I'm interested if you have ever heard that before. Uh, it, it's actually one of the things I've heard on the uh, chronic GVHD chat groups. Uh, I've heard other people using things like benzodiazepines uh, to help uh, with, with muscle pains, uh, but I'm not certain if there's any uh, clear um, thing from a symptomatic uh, point of view. And then I guess my, my, other, my next comment is, is that uh, as you pointed out, Dr. Pusik, that uh, absolutely, we have newer drugs nowadays, uh, ruxolitinib, uh, brutinib, uh, and, and the like, and the ROC inhibitor that uh, certainly uh, may be options that might one might want to try in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for these comments. Yeah, and absolutely, we did replace his magnesium, have him drink tonic water, and, and various other um, as ancillary measures, which were only marginally successful. And I'd like to encourage all the participants, if you have a question, type it in the chat or raise your hand and, and we'll try and get it in there as we go through the cases. I think you have two more, Iskar, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, take it away. So the second case was a woman, 45 year old. She had a transplant in 2006, also unrelated donor, single dose TBI as a part of conditioning. She uh, didn't have significant acute GVHD. And then she went on, to develop severe uh, steroid refractory chronic GVHD. And she had variety of NIH-defined chronic GVHD manifestations with sclerotic chin skin changes and subcutaneous thickening with characterconjunctivitis sica, sica with lichenoid uh, changes in her mouth and erythema and some moderate uh, joint stiffness. But then she also had a variety of atypical chronic GVHD manifestations with some diffuse edema that was present on and off with some uh, central nervous system symptoms with fogginess and world finding difficulties, poor memory, gait balance. And again, uh, evaluation with MRI and EEG was normal. Uh, she had peripheral neuropathy. She had lipoid dystrophies that were thought to be related to chronic GVHD and insulin resistance. And then she had renal involvement and she was extensively evaluated by our colleagues from 
renal department and she had nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic range proteinuria. They were unable to do actually kidney biopsy because she would have severe skin pain after lidocaine injections. And then she was started on cyclosporin, primarily for renal involvement, and she responded well to it. And with time, her kidney function normalized and her nephrotic syndrome resolved and she responded to cyclosporin. And she also had some evidence of serocytes with periodic pleural effusions. And this is a picture of her skin. She also had very interesting calcium deposits in her skin and the pant biopsy showed morpha protunda with dystrophic calcifications. And of course, even when her severe sclerotic manifestations would get better with treatment, this um, uh, calcification would still be present. That would They would sometimes appear maybe a little softer overall, but they would resist. And she is a nice example of somebody who was treated again for a period of 12, 14 years and was on variety of medications, essentially everything that, that we can think of using for chronic GVHD. She was very early on on ruxolitinib when she got it through compassionate use. She was on ixazomib trial. She was on ibrutinib. We tried to get baricitinib, but it was denied. Uh, when velumosative trial was available, we screened her, but she received too many prior therapies to be eligible. Then um, there was nothing available at the time, so ruxolitinib was uh, restarted. And she had at that time, I remember I took care of her during that period of time, and she had a, a very decent response for ruxolitinib for a period of time, but then continued to progress. And then finally, when Belumosudil was available, she was tried for about a year on Belumosudil and again had initial response with some skin softening. And most actually of her atypical manifestation have resolved. Her kidney function normalized even on um, cyclosporin, her cognitive functions improved, her edema resolved, but she continued to struggle with sclerotic uh, GVHD. And as of just last month, she started um, oxalitinib as a compassionate use um, because she also wasn't uh, eligible for the protocol. So I can again stop here and kind of bring it back to Jeff uh, as, as an example, how sometimes these atypical manifestations can respond to treatment and can reappear as we, as we taper uh, immunosuppression. Yeah, thank you. This is a, uh, I, I, when I was reviewing this case uh, on your slides, uh, I was, was taken by this uh, laundry list of chronic graft versus host disease medications and kind of feeling a bit stuck. Uh, as to what one might uh, consider uh, next, uh, given that you've really tried uh, what really are sort of the 2020 to uh, at least consider to be uh, the, the major medications. And I guess I would send a comment back to you, and this is every time that I have sort of listened to any of these new trials coming on out, is I'm, I'm wondering from a larger perspective whether we have to start thinking about this in a little different way where we may need to begin to multiple combination of these medications into different mechanisms. And that may be, you know, all the trials that we see, they're, one, they're usually a one medication and seeing 30 to 50% response rates. Uh, but I'm actually wondering if, if, if anything we've learned, for instance, from targeted oncology is that you may target one pathway and another pathway just gets upregulated. I'm wondering if that may be, if you had any comment on whether yeah. we need more than one drug at a time. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, in, in a real life, we will often have patients who have been, let's say, on ruxolitinib and then they stop responding or have a little bit of progression. And then nowadays we will add belumosidil, but not necessarily stop ruxolitinib, but maybe adjust the dose a little bit, lower the dose one, one level down, and then continue two drugs together considering that they have a different mechanism of action and could possibly work uh, uh, together without overwhelming immune suppressions and not so severely immunosuppressed and without additional uh, side effect. 
And, and Iskra and Jeff, do uh, you use steroids only at the beginning or did you use that persistently throughout the entire treatment time? You said steroids? Yeah, the prednisone. Well, usually I would say only at the beginning. I think that most of these people who have been through all these different various manifestation uh, drugs for GVHD are not either not on steroids or they're on some very minimal dose that might be really used to control adrenal insufficiency or, or something of that. But none of them are on high doses of steroids, I would say maximum up to 10 milligrams. And typically they have seen a fair share of steroid pulses. So uh, we don't typically keep them on, on steroids. We might okay, use- and Go ahead. No, no, please. There's a couple of questions that have come up, and I think maybe we could put these in before we go to case three. Um, and, and I think uh, one of them was around back on the myositis and uh, use of ancillary uh, support by pain services and palliative teams um, and, and your experience, both of you, with that. Uh, certainly, I, I know at our center we do and find it very useful, but uh, you want to comment on that? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for, for that question. Yes, we I uh, didn't include that in the presentation, but absolutely we we include uh, uh, the pain, uh, pain team and we use a variety of ancillary measures uh, to help this patient out, include our colleagues from physical therapy and occupational therapy and 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 try variety of, of ancillary measures that can often be of a lot of help in uh, this patient. So I'm actually illustrating that a little bit more in the case three, but I think that this is an essential part of, of treatment of chronic GVHD. Mm -hmm. And, the and other, maybe to both of you is, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I just was good. I, I completely agree. And the other uh, component is, is that if your center has a chronic pain uh, clinic, uh, that looks at a variety of non-pharmacological things like uh, biofeedback uh, and, and the like, that can also be very helpful. And then just another one, and I think I'll, I'll kind of make it a bit more of a general question, but Dr. Gandhi had asked about adding in ECP in combination, but do you, the combinations, do you um, try to do two or three drugs and, and uh, synergize mechanisms? something like ECP plus ruxolitinib or something else? And what is your thoughts about that, uh, both of you? Uh, well, I, I would say absolutely. And the problem is ECP was that when these drugs were in their early trials, then they could not be on ECP. This was one of the exclusion criteria. So many of these people have stopped ECP because, before going on these trials. But if when the trials are done or if they're not on trials, then absolutely we try to keep them on ECP and then add some of these uh, new drugs to it and combine drugs, as we already said. Okay, thanks. Um, Jeff, any other addition? No, I would, I would completely agree with that. I mean, ECP is a really nice background uh, thing to do. It may not, it may, I'm not certain if every center is the same. The ours, we don't need to have the kind of approvals uh, that might need it for a variety of drugs. So it's easy to stay on ECP while you may be on a different drug at the same time. And I guess I'll just bang my, the, the drum that I've been banging a little bit the last year or so is that I do think we need to start thinking, um, now that we have some approved uh, agents and ones that we know efficacy, we need to start thinking about um, synergistic mechanisms and whether there are combinations of two drugs or three drugs that make sense and should be evaluated in trials, similar to the way we do chemotherapy or, or, or anything else. But I just put that out there. I, I think we need to start moving on. We do serial single agent a lot of times, and we need to start thinking about uh, combinations, especially with these atypical manifestations. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Iskra, take it away on the third, please. So very briefly, the third case was a man who is now 74. He was uh, uh, 62 at the time when he got his transplant. He got bucy conditioning, had some skin acute GVHD grade two that resolved. And then he was on our decitabine maintenance study uh, for I think six or eight months after his transplant. And then after that, uh, towards the end of that, that study, he started developing some neuropathy that then progressed to really severe sensation of skin feeling like some sunburn that initially was so just being a part of neuropathy, but then he developed more tingling, 
and hypersensitivity, some areas uh, of leaking oil changes, but nothing overwhelming. Mostly this was this intense burning and pruritus, and then allodynia and hyperalgesia to the point that he was really unable to wear regular clothes. And he developed also proximal muscle weakness. The enzymes uh, were normal, aldolase, CK were normal, um, or other evaluation, nothing really revealed anything uh, abnormal on his testing. And the only other side of chronic GVHD was some mild to moderate eye chronic GVHD involvement. So his skin biopsy showed no inflammation and just some uh, uh, eosinophil in, in, in dermis and some uh, evidence of lichenoid chronic GVHD. But then further biopsies showed and, and proved that he had small uh, fiber neuropathy. And you can see here the levels that are smaller, that are um, shorter than, than, normals, than normal levels. And uh, again, the full evaluation with MRI and EMG and nerve conduction studies were normal, and there was no evidence of large fiber neuropathy. Q-sweat study were normal. There were no infections. All his medications were reviewed and excluded as potential culprits. So he was again treated with usual suspects here with various additional therapies to help with this pain, such as pregabalin, duloxetine, amitriptyline, lidocaine. He was started on ECP. He was sent to our colleagues at NIH, where he was actually seen by Dr. Jay Shah, who is the world-renowned specialist for small fiber neuropathy. And uh, it was recommended to start him on vitamin E for some antioxidant properties. But uh, despite everything that was done, his condition really was not getting better. And he, we tried to obtain roxolitinib for him and eventually were able to get it in 2017. He had some improvement, but he still continued to have allodynia. And then belumosidil was just this year added. He was on it for about a month, uh, but he didn't have response. And then he stopped it because high copay. But I think current plan is to add belumosidil and, and see whether that can give him some relief. But I think that currently it's somewhat stable and he, he learned to live with it, but it is not resolved. And I bring this as a case to show challenges in, in diagnosing this kind of atypical manifestations when aside of that, there is only minimal chronic GVHD otherwise, and, and treatment decisions when a diagnosis is uncertain. So any, any, any other comments from Jeff or Kirk? Yeah, I mean, this. I, I think that this really shows, as, as you stated, the challenges and the really the poor quality of life that often happen. And, and again, also shows where you don't you see this as a problem, uh, but not a lot of other chronic GVHD uh, stuff. Need a little bit of skin and lichenoid changes here. So, it really emphasizes why these sorts of patients need to get to onto chronic GVHD clinical trials so we can start to learn more. Yeah. I think I'd like to, since we have about six minutes left, just to stay on the time, um, I'd like to open it up for some additional questions, either on this case or just in general. Uh, either raise your hand or type it in, if you're shy, type it into the chat. Um, and I'm just looking to see if anybody's raised their hand. Um, otherwise, I am going to ask you guys a couple questions myself, if I have to, we're going to Okay, I don't see anybody, everybody's being a little shy today. Um, but um, I, both of you, I guess I, I wanna go back to the steroid issue. Um, we all hate it, but uh, the question comes down to the anti-inflammatory impact uh, and the mechanistic impact of steroids. Um, is it, are they necessary? Because there's this whole question around refractory versus dependent steroids. Uh, you know, in GVHD. And, and do you want to comment on that in atypical GVHD on whether it's necessary to always combine with steroids or not? I think, Iskra, you're expressing the opinion not to, but I'd just like to hear a bit more. I, I would not necessarily say not to. I think often when we have somebody, when we are designing trials, for example, we often will allow a brief pulse of steroids at the beginning to kind of cool off uh, 
GVHD manifestations. And I think that particularly with atypical manifestations that uh, they might respond to a pulse of steroid. So I'm not completely opposed to it. I think that on a long run, we have to have better ideas, but that uh, in somebody who has not seen a pulse of steroids for a period of time, giving a pulse of steroids and giving it a shot is a very reasonable idea and something uh, I would do, particularly for atypical manifestations. It may also impact as to what the atypical manifestation of what you're seeing. Um, many of, for instance, the autoimmune hemolytic anemias or the ITPs can be very chronic lasting years. And, uh, you know, one perhaps doesn't want to start getting into a situation where you're getting so anemic or and that you're needing multiple blood transfusions. And the reality is steroids do often bring hemoglobins up in those scenarios. And you may need to have periods where you're on more steroids and less. So I think it also depends a lot upon what the atypical manifestation is. Okay. And just, I got one more question for you guys. It's a bit on the controversial side, but do we need to have a revision of the NIH diagnostic criteria to uh, expand them to include all the atypical manifestations? Right now, you can still say a patient doesn't have chronic GVHD with the NIH criteria, but they have atypical manifestations. And uh, the question is, should, should they be modified? Should we be proposing that? I would suggest the answer to that is yes. I, you know, we have in, in the, uh, the paper that, that we published uh, earlier, we tried to acknowledge that there are many confounding factors, but in the end, I think that, you know, we have enough, we have some data that chronic GVHD affects kidneys and, and, and including the biopsy data that, that shows that. We now have mouse model for central nervous system. So I think that, I think that we should begin to start to think about modifying those diagnostic criteria. Iskra, your thoughts and Steve Pavletic, I see you on here, so I'm going to put, I'm going to point you out and say I want to hear your comment on this. Go ahead, Iskra. Well, I could say kind of it can go both <clears> ways. <throat> For the fun of it, I can just say maybe, maybe I can say no, we don't need to modify them, unless, but what we need to do is that we need to document uh, in details what the manifestations are and say that that the manifestations could be. Uh, related to chronic GVHD, kind of what we are doing now, because we it's not always that certain, and there are often a lot of confounding factors with these people that could cause them to have some of these manifestations. Sometimes you can do kidney biopsy, it can be relatively easy, but with cognitive or, or some of uh, peripheral neuropathy, it's not always that easy to just blame it on, on GVHD. Steve, any additional thoughts? You're looking very thoughtful there. Oh, yeah, I don't see myself here, but uh, I'm glad you think so. Oh, okay. Um, well, first, of course, everything's been said. Uh, great session. Thank, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's an evolving area. Uh, atypical manifest manifestations actually are, right, uh, part of the NIH uh, diagnostic criteria. Uh, if they are uh, associated with some uh, distinctive or diagnostic signs. So it's really that it's not that they're not and they are listed on the forms. It's just a matter when they, they come in isolation, you know, oh, this patient has CNS, chronic GVHD. I mean, right, it's hard to accept something that's so rare, but it's undeniable there is and so on strong evidence. So uh, this is why we are proposing to... Uh, 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 improve our tracking of this right uh really trying to understand the true magnitude of the problem and improve our studying it's our sense that uh, vast majority of these cases don't get uh, really registered we hear a lot you know uh talking to each other but it sort of goes somewhere into waste bag you know and uh, we don't we do very poor job in studying those so it's i totally agree could this be on the philosophical uh, level, uh, chronic GVHD? Sure, because we know that uh, that uh, uh, Ken Cook's paper that uh, 2017 Jeff showed, you know, it's a uh, uh, three three uh, pathophysiological uh, uh, pathways, right? Uh, inflammation, uh, fibrosis, uh, dysregulation. Uh, and uh, all those go out on dysregulation. So sure, you can say that's kind of part of the spectrum of the disordered, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, immunity in chronic GVHD. If we decide one day to call it so, well, then we're going to need a fourth consensus or something, you know, but uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it, we need to study this much better. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Uh, I'm sorry we're running out of time. Uh, Iskrik, if you could stop sharing your screen. I have about two or three, three or four uh, administrative slides just to run through for everybody so you uh, know how to um, get, hang on. Um, just to give you a couple announcements, uh, there are future interactive ones. Uh, one is planned in January on a whole bunch of the complications of, of chronic GVHD and supportive care. Um, if it's like all the ones so far, it's going to be fantastic. And uh, just to also um, uh, the um, uh, providing equity, uh, equitable and inclusive care uh, for patients on November 4th. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the uh, quality of life pre-transplant, post-transplant, uh, again, um, for an on-demand course. And I apologize, we didn't realize this till it was too late that we had scheduled this during the virtual workshop. So I think you can still register and it is ongoing right now. And I, excel, I encourage you to try and get on that. I've registered and I'm gonna go on it pretty soon. Um, and, um, oh yes, and, and then the Meredith uh, Foundation, uh, Cowden Foundation, uh, we'll be having a session on January 27th, how to choose drugs for chronic GVHD, and Joe, Joseph Padala will be uh, uh, talking about that.